Here it is. Well, good morning everyone. I'm Julia Randolph and I'll be presenting my project on evaluating percutaneous heart valves. Um, first, we're going to go over some background information on the project itself and then talk about the valves that were used throughout the project and the performance <coughs> metrics used to test these valves are, um, and some equipment and tools um, used throughout the project as well as measurements taken. And um, I'm going to show you a short video on the testing process itself, along with the results I obtained and possible future work. So some background on uh, my project is um, currently heart disease is um, the leading cause of death worldwide. And it results in about 250,000 um, valve replacements or repairs every year. And despite new um, many new valve designs over the years. Um, no valve compares to that of our natural heart valve and its functions. Um, a little background on valves. Um, valves um, allow blood to um, move from one chamber to the other with inside the heart or out of the heart in one direction. Um, and it also controls the flow of blood through the heart uh, by opening and closing during contractions of the heart. The first valve that we, um, or that I looked at was the tilt mechan a mechanical disc valve that was a Bjork Shilly tilted disc valve with a diameter of 24 millimeters. These valves are normally chosen for durability purposes. Um, the next valve we looked at was a St. Jude's medical um, biological porcine valve with a diameter of 27 milliliters. These valves are normally looked at um, are normally chosen for um, purposes of, of the fact that they uh, most closely mimic that of a functions of that of a um, natural heart valve. And um, lastly, a percutaneous heart valve, which is a heart valve delivered through a catheter. Um, the valve I obtained was an Edwards Life Sciences Sapien XT valve with a diameter of 29 millimeters. Um, talking more about percutaneous valves, um, it has been more difficult to conduct research um, and make improvements on these valves due to FDA um, regulations because um, most valve surgical prosthetic surgical valves are tested um, in animals and that but the FDA guidelines um, do not uh, this is not appropriate for um, per the percutaneous valve enterprise which makes um, uh, having the, makes testing and improving on these valves even more difficult. Um, but just because it's hard difficult, um, it doesn't mean that they're not good valve designs because currently looking at these percutaneous valve designs, they offer potentially superior hemodynamics, which is um, how the blood, blood flows through um, the valves um, compared to that of regular prosthet or past prosthetic surgical um, valves. So I'm going to show you a short video on the valve that we obtained, or the valve that I obtained myself. And up in the corner, you can also see the dimensions of the valve that we obtained. So um, I was very lucky to obtain this particular valve because they're very hard to get and extremely expensive. Um, so lucky to be able to obtain this valve. But I also wanted to, as I begin to advocate for percutaneous um, valve replacement, um, I have to begin by acknowledging a high performance standard in evaluating um, these valves. Um, because currently FDA, um, uh, performance metrics uh, do uh, they take into account material um, things such as material testing are or, or important to material testing such as fatigue testing as well as flow performance such as transvalvular pressure drop and although these um, 
uh, performance metrics are important. They do not take into account um, the physiological um, um, conditions of the patient, such as um, their heart condition and in-depth um, uh, knowledge of it, the flow inside the heart. Um, which is why I want to investigate vortex ring formation as a um, performance metric for percutaneous hearts, um, which to our knowledge has never been studied before. Um, because it's an important mechanism for fluid transport within the, the, ven or within the ventricular, um, during ven ventricular filling, and um, has been characterized as the natural mechanism for efficient mass transport within the heart. Um, and studies have shown that in the presence of prosthetic heart valves, a non-optimal vortex ring formation compromises the efficiency and performance of the heart valve, um, leading to non-favorable operating conditions. So not only would it benefit the patients themselves, but um, surgeons, the FDA, and engineers and scientists, and their goal to um, establish a more rigorous um, evaluation process as well as improve the um, process of uh, the designs for the percutaneous valves. Um, so uh, based on um, a studies that my advisor Dr. Paracas has conducted and other researchers, uh, it has been shown that a vortex ring is naturally optimized with an optimal range between 3.5 and 5.5 formation number which is most closely represented by the second vortex ring shown here in this picture. Um, this is the B vitro heart system that was used during the course of my project. It is a piston driven heart simulator. It enables me to vary the stroke volume and heart rate, which is very important to my project. And it also enables um, pressure and flow rate measurements to be taken upstream and downstream of the prosthetic heart valves. And if, as we look at this picture, my valve was placed, or any of the par, um, prosthetic heart valves that were tested are placed here in the mitral position. And in the aortic valve, um, there was a mechanical disc valve that stayed in the same orientation for all prosthetic heart valves tested and all testing conditions. <coughs> Um, other parts of the heart system is this is the super pump that enables um, the simulation of a beating heart through pumping liquid in and out of this ventricle chamber shown here. Um, and it's controlled by this um, piece shown here. And also the electromagnetic flow meter that enables the control and measurement of the flow rate. Uh, a overview of the materials that were used throughout this was the heart valves that we discussed earlier, the heart system that we just saw. Um, to enable proper readings through the flow meter, a saline solution of 0.9 mass per volume concentration was used, as well as distilled water, valve seals to ensure no leaks like this one shown here, and various tools in the putting together and taking apart of the um, of the heart system so that we could place valves in and out of the um, simulator. Measurements taken, um, I took, bare, I took um, measurements at varying stroke volumes with 70 milliliters being an average stroke volume for a resting adult human and varying heart rates that are shown here in this table. Um, and as well as uh, varying per peripheral resistances. Um, to obtain an aortic pressure listed um, within that range. I also um, used pressure transducers and a uh, flow probe to obtain um, atrial ventricular and um, aortic outflow pressure values um, upstream and downstream of the prosthetic heart valve. Uh, the, all of these values were used in the calculation of the vortex ring formation number, which is an um, a indicator of flow performance, and it is defined by this equation shown here, with U being the mitral velocity profile, uh, T being the flow duration time, and D being the valve diameter. Um, this is an example of what you would see um, during uh, the uh, on the on the software during the testing process. 
Um, and it's where we derive all the measurements just shown. You can see here the red line indicates the a um, aortic pressure and the yellow line here indicates the ventricular pressure, um, just as examples. I'm going to show you a short video now on the testing process. Um, during the testing process, the valve is always in the mitral position, as discussed earlier. And um, during the testing project, during the data collection, 10 cycles per trial are taken and then averaged together to obtain um, the, uh, the values or data. Um, this is a table of the data I took with the mechanical valve as well as past data from a study that Dr. Paracos conducted um, to show the accuracy of my results. Um, this data shows the ventricular, um, the filling phase of the cardiac cycle when vortex ring formation is present. And as discussed earlier, um, vortex ring formation number is naturally optimized with an um, optimal range between 3.5 and 5.5. So as we can see here, the cream colored squares represent values that were below the optimal range and the red color uh, squares represent numbers above the optimal range. These charts show um, the formation numbers at the different stroke volumes, such as the 30 milliliter, uh, 70, 50 milliliter, 70 milliliter, and 90 milliliter. Um, this, uh, this data shows um, that stroke, as the formation numbers change, so did the stroke, or as formation numbers changed with the stroke volume and heart rates, um, and as well as increased as the stroke volume and heart rates, heart rates increased. We can also see for the mechanical and tissue valves, they received, um, they were in optimal range at different varying stroke volumes and um, heart rates as, as indicated here by these red lines. So within the red lines, that would be in their optimal range. These are the instantaneous results of my vortex, um, vortex ring formation number. Um, and as we can see, uh, with the increasing, for, these are for the mechanical disc valve that I took the data on. Um, and as we can see with the increasing stroke volume, uh, it leads to an increasing uh, vortex ring formation slope, um, which is expected with a higher heart rate and higher stroke volume. Uh, we can also see that it start um, on the onset of the valve uh, opening. It's a very quick. It rises very quickly on the onset of the valve opening and eventually plateaus to its final value at the top. We can also see for a mechanical valve that a its optimal range is around 50 is of a stroke volume of 50 milliliters because it is in between the 3.5 and 5.5 um, range for formation number. Um, my next step was to test the percutaneous valve, but despite proper setup and um, information gathered, many issues were encountered. Um, there were many uh, leaks within the heart simulator itself, as well as leaks that um, came from the Sapien XT valve itself due to its sh shape. We did not have a proper seal for it, so um, we tried many fixes. Uh, to try and resolve this problem, and the final fix resulted in um, myself designing a piece on cam and drilling out the piece shown here, and drilling tiny holes in the rim to suture this valve um, inside the rim so that there were no leaks, as well as um, there, uh, with high pressure, the valve wouldn't slide out. Um, there also were air leaks, but th that issue was quickly resolved after discovery. Um, but once that issue was resolved, a fuse blew in the super pump, and once that fuse was replaced, it resulted in a great deal of vibration, and this vibration would not allow me to obtain good results or the results that I needed, so we could not continue with the Sapien XT valve. Um, looking forward, despite uh, the issues that were encountered, a study, uh, there can be a continuation of this project um, using percutaneous valves, and using vortex ring formation number as a performance metric um, to establish vortex ring formation number as a good performance um, 
a performance metric for percutaneous valves um, if the issues uh, discussed before were resolved. Um, I want a special thank you to my advisors, Dr. Paracas and Dr. Altai for all their help, as well as lab manager Mark Showalter for spending countless hours with me in the fluids lab. Um, also, a special thanks to the National Science Foundation um, for supporting the establishment of the Advanced Thermal Fluids Lab here at JMU. Um, I'd also like to thank UVA Hospitals, JMU Machine Shop, and friends and family. You were saying that the um, valves are very expensive. Other than the fact that it's used in a heart, what makes it expensive? Like, is it the materials or just Um, it's a com it's a combination of things. Um, a normal heart valve itself. Um, I mean, medical things cost me medical stuff like that cost a bunch in the first place. Like a normal mechanical valve would cost around five thousand, six thousand dollars. Uh, this valve, since it's so new, and it's this is one of the very few valves that's FDA approved because many valve because it's been so hard to test these valves, and so this is one of the very few that is out there, which also help like helps like increase the price. So I mean, it's up to like thirty thousand dollars for the valve, which is like super expensive. And I mean, it just it kind of happened with the tissue valves; they were really expensive too because I mean it is material and they're kept in like a formaldehyde solution, and so they can degrade easily so it's also like it's that's another component to it but they're also so n these particular valves are so new um, that it's and there's not a huge market out there for them yet so that drives up the price a lot what, what is it actually made out of? um part of it is made out of so if we look at this right here so this part right here is the tissue part of the valve so it's um made out of it depends on the valve i'm pretty sure this one's porcine material um like like the tissue valve so that tissue part and then this is like a fabric type material that it's sewn to at the bottom to keep it um attached to this metal case this metal casing on the outside because the metal casing helps um shrink the valve um, to be able to fit into the catheter Do you see this type of valve overtaking the one in current use in the future? If it's able to be tested more and like more widely tested to be able to, because just because they haven't, it's been very hard. A bunch of companies are trying to get valves FDA approved. So it's, it's coming up and I think it will continue to get improved to the point where I think it will be the valve of the future just because it's, you don't have to open up your chest to get it delivered, but it's also, it is a tissue valve and tissue valves degrade within like 10 years and so mechanical valves are normally used for like younger ch children because like their durability and they last forever so you don't see tissue valves being used um per se like in younger children you only really see them used in older adults so it's as they're advancing you'll see them becoming more prevalent in different um age groups and different types of people it depends uh, every type of valve depends on the patient that it's being put into any other questions well thanks for coming to our presentation Thank you.